Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, welcome to CSIS. Uh, our event today is Next Steps in Critical Infrastructure Protection Challenges for Congress and CISA. Uh, we're lucky to have two uh, leaders in this field, Representative John Katko and Director Jen Easterly of CISA. I'm going to give a brief overview of their bios because they're both overachievers and if I read their whole bio, it would take the full hour. Uh, our format today will be um, I'll introduce them. Uh, they will make opening remarks, first Representative Katko and then Director Easterly. Uh, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll turn and open it up to the audience for questions. So I'm looking forward to today's event. I've actually been looking forward to it all week. So a uh, great way to close out Cybersecurity Month uh, here at CSIS. Let me start. Representative John Katko is the Republican leader of the House Committee on Homeland Security and he represents the 24th district, which we were talking before and is around Syracuse. A former prosecutor in New York, uh, he worked on numerous cases. I saw he has extensive RICO experience. I think RICO is perfect for cybersecurity. So he comes in well prepared. He's uh, served on the Homeland Security Committee since joining Congress and held a number of leadership roles, including ranking member of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation Subcommittee. And he'll tell us about some of the legislation he's got uh, in the works. Um, Director Jen Easterly, probably uh, known to most of you, Director of CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, prior to that at Morgan Stanley in New York. So this is sort of a New York event. I wasn't planning that when we did it, but uh, we've got upstate and downstate covered. Uh, distinguished career, two tours at the White House, Deputy for Counterterrorism at NSA, a uh, two-time recipient of the Bronze Star, a uh, West Point graduate, and she asked me to stop there because she uh, doesn't want me to go through the whole list, but I'm only halfway through. So uh, again, two great speakers, two leaders in the field. I think critical infrastructure protection has been highlighted by the <laughs> recent events that we've all seen, uh, by the ransomware episodes, and more importantly, by the activities, not just of Russia, but of China and Iran. So this is a very timely, uh, timely uh, in series to have a discussion of. And Representative Katko, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that nice introduction. And obviously, Jen is uh, she's an amazing person, and I'm happy to be here with her. So thanks for having me here. I, I could pick no better way to close out National Cybersecurity Awareness Month than to be discussing the very issue today with you all. Now, I'm delighted to be here with my friend uh, and a superb talent and director Easterly. I want to thank her for her service over not just the past 100 days and her new role, but over the course of her 20 plus years in the military. I've been thoroughly impressed by the close relationship CISA and the Office of the National Cyber Director have built and have no doubt that partnership is the result of the leadership at the helm uh, of both those fine individuals. That level of co uh, collaboration and communication is essential in protecting federal networks and our nation's critical infrastructure, and I hope to see it continue. The truth is we simply don't have the luxury of succumbing to jurisdictional infighting. Those days are over and they can't be part of the uh, cybersecurity lexicon going forward. It's just, there's just too much at stake here. So let me kind of set the scene a little bit if I can. Um, I've had several priorities I'd like to discuss today, but first I'd like us to take a step back and reflect over the past year. We started off 2021 by uncovering the impact of the devastating SolarWinds cyber espionage campaign. But as we all know, the attacks did not stop there, unfortunately. While they may seem distant, the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability and several significant ransomware attacks, including the attacks on Colonial Pipeline, Kaseya, and JBS happened this year alone, just this year, just in the last few months. As a result, CISA has issued an unprecedented number of emergency directives, alerts, and advisories regarding serious vulnerabilities and cyber threats. The past year has shown us that our adversaries are not letting up, as evidenced by Microsoft's recent announcement that the same Russian actors behind the devastating SolarWinds campaign are trying to recreate their success. 
While it does not appear this uh, was widely successful, it underscores the fact that tough talk with Putin has not been a sufficient deterrent. Things are not getting better and we must do more. One of my top priorities over the past year has been to equip CISA so that it cannot just compete against nation state adversaries like Russia and China, but win. And if we're gonna win, we're gonna need to bolster CISA. CISA has made great progress this year, advancing its mission, in part due to some of the key authorities in the NDAA that CISA has now fully implemented. I'm also planning to build on the success by passing additional authority improvements this year, such as supporting ranking member Garbarino's bill to make the CISA director a five-year term, and by working across the aisle and the chamber to get mandatory cyber incident record, reporting across the finish line. That's critically important, and we're gonna talk more about that today. CISA must also be fully funded. I have been a strong proponent of responsible growth at CISA, and I'm pleased with the House Committee Pass Appropriations Bill that puts it on that path. These authorities and resources are key elements that will ensure CISA can effectively carry out its mission as envisioned by Congress. But cyber incidents are rarely sector specific, and we need to continue to build on the resources within CISA as a central agency that can quickly connect the dots on a malicious cyber campaign multiple sectors, then share that information across a broader critical infrastructure community. But CISA can't do this successfully unless it has a high degree of visibility into cybersecurity threats and incidents impacting private sector networks. And I'm pleased to have partnered with Chairwoman Thompson and Subcommittee Chairwoman Clark uh, on vital legislation that will help close this visibility gap by requiring covered entities to report covered cyber incidents to CISA, allowing CISA to quickly analyze the information and develop alerts and mitigations that can be shared with the critical infrastructure community. While the importance of that effort cannot be overstated, we also must remember that there is no silver bullet. We live in a world of an increasingly interdependent web of hardware, software, services, and other connected infrastructure. Single points of failure and layers of systemic importance across this ecosystem leave the potential for a cascading impact if compromised. Most Americans had never heard of a colonial pipeline until they felt the effects of the gas shortage caused by its shutdown. Most of us had also never heard of solar winds, even though its software was used by the federal government and 80% of the Fortune 500 companies. That's incredible. I appreciate that CISA has been attempting to take this head on, but Congress must step in and help. It is also incumbent upon Congress to ensure such a program includes the appropriate guardrails, guidance, and built-in mechanisms for industry collaboration. Such an important program must be done and it must be done right. This is why I introduced bipartisan legislation to authorize the director of CISA to work in partnership with owner. Defense Collaborative, which is leveraging those new authorities in last year's NDAA. <clears throat> the JCDC will greatly improve CISA's risk management partnership across the critical infrastructure community and allow them to better defend government and private networks and share information on cyber threats. I also want to highlight some recent uh, remarks the director made, which I strongly agree. The need to move from information sharing to information enabling. I couldn't agree more. The discussions of Congress over the past decade have centered around information sharing, which is certainly important, but we also need to ensure that the information being shared with the private sector is actionable and it meets the needs of diverse sets of stakeholders. It's not a one size fits all approach. There must be a high value proposition for entities to partner with CISA. I look forward to continuing to maximize uh, the effectiveness of these programs and understand what gaps need to be solved but going forward, uh, there's many other things we need to consider. And uh, uh, I'm not, we're not gonna be able to cover them all today, but it cannot uh, all of be done without a professional cybersecurity workforce and an efficient operational organization. I have concern that CISA does not yet have the deep cadre of cybersecurity professionals it needs and lacks a professional human resources organization to bring these individuals in and retain them. The, 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 uh, the competition for talent with the private sector has never been 
more acute than it is at CISA. This is something I plan to focus on soon. And I'm pleased that Director Easterly is making this one of her top priorities and look forward to working with her on this, this effort. Now let's talk for a moment about ransomware and how to combat it. We know the dedicated men and women of CISA have been mired in the fight to protect state and local governments, small businesses, and our nation's critical infrastructure from the scourge of ransomware attacks. Just last week, CISA, in coordination with the FBI and NSA, released an alert regarding Black Matter ransomware targeting U.S. critical infrastructure entities. We just must do more to stem the tide of these attacks. This summer, I held a roundtable with regional representatives from CISA, state and local governments, and business leaders to discuss how CISA can help bolster entities to prevent and mitigate attacks. But CISA can't do it alone. State and local governments, small and medium-sized businesses, and large corporations must also step up their game. No one is immune from this threat. And we need entities to adopt basic practices on cyber hygiene, including multi-factor authentication, offsite backups, regular updates, and more. I don't want to hear about what you do after an attack. I want to hear about what you're doing before an attack. We need the White House to show our adversaries like Russia and China that there are consequences to their actions. As I laid out at the beginning of this Congress in my five pillar strategy, we must impose real cost on our cyber adversaries like China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And of course, in my opinion, and I think my opinion of many, the most malign actor in this arena is indeed China. In the cyber domain, aggression from the People's Republic to China is a persistent direct threat to our nation's ability to innovate and prosper. From an economic, defense, and homeland security perspective, deterring and countering cyber threats from China is paramount for securing the homeland and maintaining our economic security. It is extremely important that we recognize the differences between ourselves and China and capitalize on the opportunities that our system of governance presents. We must protect and encourage international norms that will allow for the trusted and successful proliferation of information and communications technologies. I cannot state clearly enough that China is a preeminent threat actor that we face as a nation and that they are increasingly leveraging the cyber realm to, imp to impact the homeland. China's Ministry of State Security has emerged as a highly capable actor in cyberspace, demonstrating increasing sophistication and operational security while undertaking a global campaign of cyber espionage for economic, political, and strategic purposes. They have increased their efforts to collect foreign data through both legal and illegal channels, and perhaps most alarming, is a legitimate concern with the CCP's ability to threaten and disrupt critical infrastructure, posing new challenges to the U.S. homeland security, prosperity, and resilience. The U.S. needs to continue attributing and punishing to the most severe extent possible nation state sponsored cyber intrusions. And our homeland security apparatus should be poised to defend against these intrusions while protecting systemically important critical infrastructure. There's nothing more important than that. So I guess in closing, I would just want to say, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm also particularly excited to be here, given that C CSIS, Syracuse University Maxwell School, collaboration on the Executive Masters in International Relations, a Syracuse degree program taught here at the CSIS campus. I look forward to future engagements across a range of important topics impacting our national security now I'm looking forward to today's conversation, as always. And thank you very much, and uh, let's have a good talk today. Great, thank you, Congressman. Uh, Director Easterly, uh, over to you. And let, let me just say that I hope we can come back to some of the, you raised many issues, but I hope we can come back to legislation and also to retention, which doesn't come up enough, but Director Easterly, please. Great. Well, thank you so much. You know, I'm a big 80s music fan, and I have to say in the immortal world, words of uh, Meatloaf, you took the words right out of my mouth. So, uh, you know, I completely agree with everything that ranking member Katko said, and I think we will, we are in for a very rich discussion. But let me just start off uh, by thanking you, Jim, uh, for hosting this. Uh, and for your leadership over the years, um, a great friend and great contribution to these really uh, important issues. And then uh, Ranking Member Katko, who's been such a fabulous advocate and partner uh, for CISA uh, in our mission uh, as the nation's quarterback for cyber defense. So as, as the Ranking Member mentioned, we are at the end of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. 
I am personally exhausted, uh, but um, uh, there's been a lot going on this month. Uh, we hosted the fourth annual National Cybersecurity Summit. Hopefully uh, some of you have seen it. If not, uh, we have posted it on CISA.gov. So that is my PSA uh, to begin with, but a lot of really good information on there. And, and how great is it when a Congressman tells you to implement multi-factor authentication? We're going to get that. Uh, we're going to get that in the consciousness of Americans, because, you know, as I always like to say, this is not a technology issue. This is a people issue, and so we have a lot of work to do. But it starts with uh, the basics, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. So, for the audience who may not know uh, about CISA, and I suspect most do, but I'll just um, give a couple lines here. We were established at the end of 2018. Our third birthday is coming up here on the 16th of November. Uh, but we were established to really fill, it, fill it a gap, to be the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency. And our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, to manage, and to reduce risk to the cyber and physical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. To get gas at the pump, to get food at the grocery store, to get money from the bank, to get their power, their water, their health care. So it's the systems and networks that underpin all of our lives. Now, as we know, over 85% of that infrastructure is in private hands. So securing a, it has to be a shared responsibility. So as I like to say, this, is, this conversation is all about collective defense. And in that particular context, uh, I really think we're at an inflection point. You know, never has collaboration mattered more given the threat environment that we faced. And you just heard a little bit about it from ranking member Katko. It's nation states, it's cyber criminals, it's hacktivists, it's insiders. And you know, it's CISA collaboration along with innovation and service and accountability is a core value. With public-private partnerships and information sharing are really at the center of our origin story. But as we continue to transform and mature the agency, my intent largely, and the representative uh, alluded to this, is really informed by the past four and a half years in the private sector at Morgan Stanley. And that's to really shift the, the paradigm from arguably hackneyed terms like public-private partnership, we've all been saying this for 20 plus years, to deep operational collaboration. And we can talk more about what that actually means, but <laughs> also from information sharing to information enabling. And what does that mean? Timely and relevant and most importantly, actionable data that can be used by network defenders to increase the security and resilience of their networks. So thanks to Ranking Member Katko in the US Congress, we have indeed been provided with a lot of the authorities to make this vision a reality. Authorities with the NDAA earlier this year, $650 million with the American Rescue Plan Act. And then of course, a whole boatload of responsibilities that we got in the cyber executive orders. So we are aggressively moving forward to implement all of that. And we can talk through a bunch of it, but I do wanna hit on one thing that the Congressman said, uh, and that's the uh, Joint Cyber Planning Office that we launched in August at Black Hat called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, known as the JCDC, as I like to say. I wanted to call it the Advanced Cyber Defense Collaborative, but my lawyers wouldn't let me, but we still do a lot of rock and roll there. So it really encompasses that Joint Cyber Planning Office, but it's a larger recognition that it's more than planning. It takes a full suite of capabilities to really make a difference for our nation's cybersecurity posture. Now, in some ways, the JCDC may be a little more evolutionary than revolutionary because it's really the maturation of what I think about as one of our superpowers and that's our very expansive information sharing authorities to share many to many. And that truly is powerful when you're talking about having to move at the speed of cyber. But you know, at least in a few important ways, it is novel. So first it's the only federal entity in law that brings together the full power of the federal government, NSA, CISA, FBI, Cybercom, DOD, DOJ, ODNI, along with the imagination and the innovation and the ingenuity of the private sector to create a common operating picture of the threat environment to proactively plan, that's really important. We know when bad things happen, we all do heroic things, 
But this is really about getting what I call left of boom to proactively plan for and exercise against the most serious threats to the nation and then to implement those plans to drive down scale at risk, uh, to drive down risk at scale. So the second thing I think is worth, worth noting is our plank holder partners for the JCDC are the internet service providers, the cloud service providers, the cybersecurity companies that underpin the technology of all of our infrastructure. So as a consequence, they have unparalleled visibility into domestic infrastructure. So this is really helping to solve that blind spots problem, the I can't see the dots problem. You don't want the government on that domestic infrastructure, but you have that visibility that's afforded by these companies in an anonymized way. So we can not only see those dots, but we can connect them together and then again, drive down risk at scale. So as we know in our globally connected world, our infrastructure and our American way of life really faces a very wide array of risks with very serious consequences. And today, you know, everything is a system of systems. We really can't just think about it as siloed critical infrastructure sectors. You have complex designs with numerous interdependencies, systemic risks that, as the Congressman said, can have cascading effects. I'm a Douglas Adams fan as well. I'm sure nobody will get this illusion, but I like to call this the Dirk Gently problem. Everything is connected. Everything is interdependent. So everything is vulnerable. And we've known it for years uh, that nation state actors, criminals, they increasingly leverage cyberspace. Uh, and traditional physical means to subvert our power, American security, and our way of life. So, uh, and many of these challenges were exacerbated by the pandemic, uh, where we had an unprecedented number of Americans working from home. So it just meant that actors, uh, we made it a little bit easier for actors to exploit vulnerabilities, uh, and that really expanded exponentially. And, and I would just foot stomp what the Congressman said about ransomware, truly a scourge that is affecting all of our lives every day. And it really illuminates the point about digital and physical infrastructure, everything's converging. So you see these attacks that can have real impacts on schools, on police departments, on hospitals, on small businesses around the country, and they're growing in number and scale and sophistication. So I'm particularly concerned about the democratization of these capabilities. You know, you look at the ransomware market in particular, developers that create ransomware, help desk operators that run dashboard for simplified execution and management, initial access brokers that gain and, and sell entry into victim networks. So it's an ecosystem where all you need is a little bit of money to launch an attack. There's just too little friction in the system. And that's why this has to be a more than whole of government, a more than whole of nation. It really has to be a global effort to disrupt these actors wherever feasible. Uh, that means cost and position. It also means what we call at CISA deterrence through futility, making US networks sufficiently hardened that the economic cost of a given intrusion is higher than the benefit and causing most of the actors to seek another way to achieve their goals. So we think uh, we can achieve sustained progress in reducing the impact and the prevalence of intrusions affecting these networks over time. This ain't gonna happen tomorrow or next week. And that's why we all need to work together to, to leverage all of the tools of national power. It's one of the reasons why you know, we wanna have a more informed public. So we launched the one-stop shop of ransomware.gov, central location for guidance toolkits. So you can go there, understand what it is, but more importantly, how to defend yourself. So you know, I do wanna close by specifically thanking uh, Ranking Member Katko for taking on a leadership role on a variety of the cybersecurity and critical infrastructure priorities from enhancing CISA's industrial control system capabilities uh, to authorizing CISA's ability to identify and designate systemically important critical infrastructure. We hope that ends up uh, in the NDAA to really ensuring that CISA receives that critical cyber incident information by a mandatory incident reporting. And we can talk more about all of that, but. Uh, that support, that leadership uh, is incredibly important to the success of our ability to help defend our nation. As I always say, it is, it has to be a team sport. And when we work together, we can achieve incredible things. So thanks again, Jim, for inviting me to be here with you alongside ranking member Katko. And I look forward to a very rich conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen. 
Um, I've already got a dozen questions, so we'll see how many we can get through. That's just as a tribute to the remarks that both of you made. Let me start with Representative Katko, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, two bills that we thought were particularly interesting when we were preparing for this. Uh, securing Systematically Important Critical Infrastructure Act and the DHS Industrial Control Systems Capability Enhancement Act. You, you can talk about whatever legislation you want, but maybe you could tell us what's on your legislative agenda. Well, I mean, I think the Systemically Important Critical Infrastructure Act is something that I'm particularly proud of because um, it's emblematic of my, my thought process with respect to how to deal with this, this unbelievable scourge of ransomware attacks. And that is to, to uh, set up a collaborative model whereby uh, it's not just regulatory in nature, but it's much more uh, collaborative in nature. And it starts with identifying what really is systemically important critical infrastructure. If everything is sicky, if, if you wanna say, then nothing really is, is uh, sicky, right? So we gotta drill down and, and with, with the input from the private sector, drill down in a collaborative manner to identify what's truly critical and then dedicate additional resources to those sectors so that they can, we can at least be as sure as we possibly can be that those sectors uh, are, are as secure as they can be from ransomware attacks and cyber, cyber intrusions. And uh, that's basically the essence of the bill. And I, that's the one I really wanna talk about because to me, um, it, it, um, any industrial control systems of course is very important and, and it gives uh, uh, system or power in that realm. But uh, really with respect to SICI, um, it's not just about regulation, uh, it can't be, but it's gotta be about setting the tone. And I really think this bill would set the tone for having that, that model whereby um, we look at uh, seemingly intractable problems in the cyber realm and don't just say, I and Congress have all the ideas. Don't just say, I and CISA have all the ideas or, or just uh, don't say that I and the private sector have all the ideas. Work together, sit down, figure out, Tell us what you think is important, and then let's take the most important of the most important and really uh, drill down to make them as safe as possible. And obviously, you know, pipelines, for example, and other things. And um, so we don't have these types of things going forward. One of the things that really bothered me about the Colonial Pipeline attack is when uh, the CEO came before me and told me all the things he did to harden his system after the fact. And that's not what we want to have. Those We don't want to have those discussions. We want to have the discussions where we're talking about hardening the systems, uh, assuming that you will be the next person to be attacked, next entity to be attacked. And, uh, and, and use this is uh, growing in tremendous resources and talent and uh, the, the experience, collective experience of the private sector to do that. I guess that's basically uh, uh, how I see it. And I, Jen wants to add something to that, please do. Yeah, I'll add something because I agree. I think this is hugely important. And you know, notwithstanding whether this ends up in legislation or not, and I certainly hope it does, we are already thinking through the model. So we're prototyping, prototyping a variety of different approaches in our um, National Risk Management Center, uh, which folks may be familiar with, to try and start identifying those entities that are in fact systemically important. And we're doing it based on uh, economic centrality, network centrality, and logical dominance in the national critical functions. Uh, and because again, we look at sectors, but we all sectors are connected. So we have to look at these from a national critical function perspective. And so we are calling this effort because SICKY sounds um, a little bit uh, disturbing sometimes, SICKY. So we're actually <laughs> calling it uh, Pisces, uh, primary systemically uh, important entities. So essentially, and in cases, I think it's important because we might talk a little bit about supply chain, but in cases where these entities are actually part of the supply chain for both hardware and software that can increase risk, that collaboration uh, that you talked about uh, will we'll focus us uh, on how these entities can work together to increase uh, the security and resilience of vulnerable technology throughout the supply chain. So we're looking at this through a variety of lenses. We're going to move forward and do it, whether it ends up in legislation or not. But I think that signaling uh, that ending up in law will be very helpful in continuing to bring the private sector to the table, because I think you know we're, we're in a state now where our critical infrastructure is much more vulnerable uh, than it should be. And frankly, that's what I worry about most every day. So uh, we did get one question in reaction to Representative Katko's remarks, and I, I hope it's a, a easy one. 
Uh, it's just basically, is there a plan to attach either of these bills to the NDAA? So maybe you can talk about the vision for moving forward. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, that's an ND, you know, like, listen, uh, NDAA has become a very potent vehicle to get legislation passed that sometimes may struggle to get going on its own. And, uh, you know, we, we have an excellent working relationship with the, with, with that, that, uh, the folks handling that area and, and HASC, House Armed Services Committee. We had uh, several bills uh, put, put into NDAA this year. And uh, we're hopeful if and when it goes to conference, I'm gonna be on that conference committee to make sure those bills stay in there. So yes, absolutely has to become a very potent ground for doing that. We need to do the markups and all the other things we need to do, but it, it's a very um, uh, it's a very potent source for us. And yeah, it's, it's a great vehicle for it, for sure. Uh, I've gotten four more questions while you two are talking. We're not going to make it. We're not going to make it, but we'll try. Um, I will note, though, that I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the acronyms. And she just threw another one at me, Pisces. I'm like, oh, my Lord. I'll never catch up with you guys. I'll oh, man, keep it's trying better, than, better than Sicky, man. I, 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 I'll give you that. No doubt about it. <laughs> Sicky was not a good choice. Um, Jen, <laughs> you, you mentioned the uh, executive order and how many tasks uh, CISA has as a result of it. Um, tell us how you're making progress on implementing that. Well, you have a year deadline or less or? Well, you know, so that was the most aggressive EO, I think in the history of EOs, but it's good because it signaled uh, a real sense of urgency. It was probably the most technical EO and I served in the White House for five and a half years in two separate administrations. And so I've seen a lot of EOs, I've written EOs. But it was good. It really, I think, met the moment, uh, the post solar winds moment, the post Microsoft Exchange moment, uh, incredibly important things in that. So really, it's all about modernization of our architecture, which is hugely important because we're dealing with legacy networks and tech debt. So we got to modernize, we got to create visibility, we got to inst instantiate technology that allows us to have endpoint uh, detection and response, and then to build a system where we can run analytics across the federal civilian executive branch enterprise that allows us to understand malicious activity. Right now, we are dealing with 102 separate departments and agencies of little tribes out there. We have to be able to uh -huh. manage the federal networks as an enterprise. This ain't easy, but you know it is a pathway, right? It's all about the right architecture, zero trust, moving to cloud, modernization, visibility. And there's some other interesting things in there about getting the playbooks right, uh, building a cyber safety review board, which I am psyched about, and then improving information sharing with uh, federal contractors, which is gonna really use the government's uh, market power to drive change in the rest of uh, industry. So we had about 35, Jim, that's a lot, uh, almost three dozen tasks that we either led or uh, were a part of. And uh, Team CISA has met all of our deadlines. Uh, but, you know, hugely important. I actually think this can make a real difference. And so I'm excited about it. Uh, I, I, I won't keep you updated on how many questions keep coming in. Let's just say we're further behind than when you started. Um, let me ask one of them, though, was from uh, a journalist, and let me direct it to Representative Katko. He, he asked, uh, is cybersecurity still a bipartisan issue on the Hill? Um, in, in the chat, I said, I think so, but you would know better than I. So can you give us a... Yeah, it, there's no doubt. Uh, and then one of the things that's really uh, uh, drawn me to Homeland Security, other than my background is 20 year federal organized crime prosecutor in, in El Paso and Puerto Rico, Albania, uh, all over the world really in upstate New York. Uh, uh, that, that kind of, you know, I, my, my experience in that realm with task forces and putting different people from different areas, different law enforcement entities and putting them under one roof really was something that made me realize how important the collaboration of bipartisanship is. And that's what really drew me to Homeland Security as well. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I do think that it is still a very, very bipartisan effort because we all want to keep the country safe. Uh, and, and when you first, first start identifying things like uh, Pisces uh, and things like that, you, um, uh, uh, you naturally think in a bipartisan manner. What comes next is where there may be some divergence. And that is, what is the tension between encouraging and fostering collaboration and over-regulating? 
And that's the rub we may have going forward to some extent, but we're, I think we can work that out. I and mean, then we're generally pretty reasonable about things. But um, I think one way to do that is in NDA, I go back to that for a second, that vehicle, um, bite-sized chunks, right? Bite-sized chunks of legislation that can be put into the NBA bill, NDAA bill, and then um, uh, have real meaningful legislation. Like to start with SICKI, my, my bills to start with, is the foundational approach to what we need to start doing in, in the critical infrastructure realm. Start with that and then build upon it slowly. I think if you try to do everything at once uh, and, and don't take that incremental approach, I think there's, there, there'll be more divergence of opinion. But generally speaking, I think we all are on the same page that we gotta do more to help. And I think one of the best examples, we all agree, CISA needs, needs to be a $5 billion agency in the next five years. And not, that's not the money pulled out of the air or a figure pulled out of the air. Looking at their long-term needs, we know they need to be plussed up significantly. And this year we plussed them up 16%. There wasn't a peep on either side, we all agreed. So, so there's a lot of areas where we agree and uh, we're gonna continue to agree going forward. Because, And you know what? And I'm not trying to blow smoke at my friend there who likes uh, 80s rock like I did, um, but um, uh, having good leaders in there at, in, at CISA and, and with Inglis, and uh, Newberger, all of them, there, we have good leaders that are collaborative minded. And that's gonna be very, very important too. Because when, when we see them doing that, it's more and more apt to do it ourselves. And that's important. It, it's, it's not fair when you ask my next, answer my next question before I can even <laughs> ask it. So I, I'm gonna try and salvage it though, because I think it's a good one. People wanna know your views on resources for CISA and you've given them, but they also wanna know what you're thinking on oversight. And then maybe, Jen, we can have you. This is your big chance to say what more you would like to see. Yeah, well, I, I'm not worried about oversight because uh, uh, Jen and I talk all the time, so we don't have to wait for hearings. Um, if we have an issue, we have a question, we have a concern, it bam, we talk to each other. And that's really important to develop that relationship going forward. So I, I'm very confident that going forward with oversight, it's not going to be an issue. It's because of their openness and because of their, uh, uh, the, the culture that's being developed at CISA, even before Jen got there, but certainly since she's been there, um, that there, we, there's a good collaborative effort going on. And I think that's why we understood by taking a look at CISA, why they need more help. And so I'm teeing that up for Jen to have some fun with. Gary, tell us what you need. All right. I got the checkbook out. <laughs> Um, well, first off, you know, as you mentioned, uh, we are getting a plus up in the budget. We are likely to get a plus up in the budget. We got the six fifty million. Um, I, I do think that we are going to need a larger budget, as you said, um, Ranking Member Catco. You know, maybe it's a five billion agency. As we are a very young agency, and as we are transforming we are making sure that we are putting all the processes in place so that we can absorb that funding and we can spend it responsibly and effectively. And so I'm excited about being able to bring in new resources. I'm particularly excited to be able to bring in new people because I think at the end of the day, this is all about talent. It's really not about technology. It's all about being able to bring on the right talent. Um, we are, and this was another thing we were directed to do in the last NDAA, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, the initiatives that were in last year's, I think how you're looking at this year's, um, it really does help us with those sort of, you know, incremental chunks of things that are helping us uh, strengthen uh, the agency. So we are in the midst of doing a force structure assessment, sort of a troops to task, as I would call it in the Army. Um, that is looking at across all of our organization to see, are we right-sized? I would point to one thing in particular uh, on a little bit of a preview. We have an amazing field force that has sort of grown up over the years. Those are our uh, cybersecurity advisors. They were at the event that you mentioned. Um, uh, we have a protective security advisors. We have our chemical security inspectors. We have our emergency comms uh, folks. I am looking to probably grow our cybersecurity folks, our state coordinators, as well as our cybersecurity advisors, because I think we need a greater presence out in the field because that's where the companies are. That's where the state and local folks are. That's where the small businesses are. And so really increasing that field force, I think that's one thing that we're going to come back on. Uh, and the other thing is we are likely going to look to increase our vulnerability management capabilities, our threat hunting capabilities and incident response capabilities. 
Uh, and we're probably going to be building off the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, the JCDC. So I do see um, uh, more resources. And, you know, in terms of uh, authorities, as I think you mentioned at the outset, in terms of human capital, uh, we are working really hard to ensure that we are streamlining our ability to bring in talent. And that's a tough thing. And I think it's a government-wide tough thing. Government just does a bad job at this. And so one thing I'm very excited about the Congress gave us now seven years ago is the cyber talent management system. We are about to put that into play on the 15th of November. That will allow us to hire people and talent much more flexibly based on aptitude and attitude. And attitude sometimes is, you know, it, it's more important, just, just as important, that culture bit um, that uh, the congressman talked about. And then we can pay them closer to market. Probably can't pay what I could pay people at Morgan Stanley, but we can play closer so we can be more competitive with private sector, with other places. But look, at the end of the day, we are looking for people who want to come in, whether it's for a career or whether it's for a couple of years, to help defend their nation. And that's a calling. It's an ethos. And so, yeah, we want talent, but we want the right type of talent. So the congressman knows that if I, I feel like I need something for the nation, I will call him up or text him and uh, we'll have that conversation. So it is fabulous to have that kind of support. And going to your point, I feel that it's very bipartisan, uh, which to me is a longtime independent and somebody who served in both administrations, I'm incredibly encouraged by. I think you're on mute, Jim. Sorry, that can't be a Zoom call unless somebody does that once. No, that's right. You you get the prize, Jim. Thank you. Uh, when I was uh, uh, working with uh, Representative McCall on the bill that eventually created CISA, I actually wanted it to be called CSA, the Cybersecurity Agency, and leave out the, the I because it has a physical. And one of the questions we got is, where does physical threats figure into your thinking for both of you, for your thinking on CISA and for your thinking on legislation. So maybe you could touch on that one, Congressman. I think, John, you should take that first. Okay. Okay, great. And Jim, I love you, man, but it's pronounced CISA. Got it. <laughs> I'm going to send it back to you. I'll send you one of my Rubik's cubes. Um, so it's a great question, right? So we are both the cybersecurity division as well as the infrastructure security division. And that was where we grew up from, from uh, the threats of 9-11 and terrorism. But let me make two points. Um, the first one is we live in a world where everything is converging. Everything is underpinned by technology. And so it's very hard to disaggregate and decompose um, how we're thinking about critical infrastructure. It's also as you look at cyber threats that can have uh, physical implications. So I actually think that it was a really good decision to put the cyber piece together with the infrastructure piece because the threats are not just about cyber. When I got to Morgan Stanley, they asked me to build their cyber defense center, the center of gravity for dealing with cyber threats. And two years later, after we'd built this big, beautiful center, they said, Jen, Great, we love it. Now we want you to deal, build a center that deals with all sorts of threats from cyber to technology, to fraud, to terrorism, to civil unrest, to weather events, to pandemics. Because it's a hybrid world we live in where a health pandemic turns into a cyber pandemic. And so again, very hard to disaggregate these things. So I think at the end of the day, it is all about the resilience and security of our infrastructure. And I think it's actually smart uh, to put these things together. Over. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I know she was going to tee off and, and answer it beautifully, but um, it's really kind of goes hand in glove with my theory of CISA. And that is that they're quarterback uh, of this area. And, um, and, 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 and the critical infrastructure uh, uh, pipelines are part of that. And why would you sec segment that off into something else? To me, they, like, the interrelatedness of it all screams for a quarterback and that quarterback screams for CISA. That's why I see it. And I, and I, I just agree with everything else John said. Right. We've gotten a series of questions that revolve around the private sector. And I was, I was pleased, I think it was Jen that said that she was tired of the term public-private partnership, which is now entering its 25th year. So pretty darn good for a policy that hasn't quite gotten off the ground. And 
collaboration might be a better word. So maybe both of you can tell us, there's a whole set of things related to that. There's the JCDC, there's regulation, and we got a question about incentives, uh, tax incentives in particular. So I, I can break that into parts, but why don't we start by talking about when you say collaboration with the private sector, what is it you both have in mind? Well, I, I look at it this way. When I was a prosecutor, um, in the midst of me being now a prosecutor, 9-11 uh, happened. And 9-11 happened because federal, state, and local law enforcement were not on the same page. There was turf battles. There was a lack of trust. There was a lack of collaboration. When I was doing death penalty cases in Puerto Rico, one agency, federal agency, didn't want to work with the other federal agency because one agency didn't require a four-year college degree for it to be an agent. That's a type of ridiculousness we had to deal with. So after 9-11, um, uh, we, we were kind of molded into the terrorism realm, what we were already trying to do in the drug enforcement realm, and that is task force concept. We put federal, state, and local all under the same roof with analysts. We, could, we would take analysts from the National Guard, for example, whatever we could do, and we'd say, we are going after X. We are going to focus on X. And I couldn't give a fiddler's fart if you were FBI or DEA or anything. I couldn't care less. Let's get the job done. And that same type of attitude has got to come to this, right? And, it, and, and it, I, I really think that um, with CISA, you got to have the private sector uh, build up a certain degree of trust. And there's got to be collaboration and interplay that is almost like muscle memory, where, okay, we got hacked. We, let, let's get this information to CISA in a, in a way that's not too burdensome. CISA has got to look at it and say, okay, got this information. What kind of directives do we see trends coming? Can we, get out quickly so that they in the private sector can operationalize that, that, that stuff in a cogent manner. That's the type of thing I envision. It's really the same type of idea where you're breaking down barriers and collaboration is key. One of the concerns I have is that if you over-regulate that, you are gonna end up having a, a lack of trust and you're gonna to have too much bureaucracy and you're gonna have what really was kind of the underpinnings of 9-11 where you had too much bureaucracy and too much stove type, uh, stove pipes, right? So you do need some regulation, obviously. It's not, it can't be the wild west, but at the same token, um, you got to work with the private sector to, in a collaborative manner, just like I work with state and local governments, and I was a Fed all the way through. But I, I work with them to get them to trust us and to share with us the data they have. I can tell you, just as an example, drill down for a second, the locals always had the best snitches. They always had the best informants. They had the guys at the street level. And we, you know, if, you know, you knock on someone's door and say, "Hey, I'm from the FBI. You want to talk to me?" I'm like, "Screw you!" But the locals knew how to do that, right? And so they became a hugely valuable portion of those task forces. And I, and I, I look here. The private sector is has, has a lot to offer, and it's and it's not like we're the government, so therefore we're going to tell you what you need to do for cyber, and that's it. No, because as bright and uh, amazing as Jen is, she doesn't have all the answers. And she, she will, but uh, in as bright as some of the people are in the private sector, they don't have all the answers. You put the team together and you have a real good interplay of collaboration, that's when you're gonna make a real difference. And that's the essence of how I, how I view the whole thing. And uh, I'll let Jen speak to it more, but that's how I see it. I mean, I, I think I, I couldn't say it much better than that. It's, you know, I'm a big puzzler. It's a lot of pieces of the puzzle coming together, the government, has some pieces, the private sector has others. You know, I have a great appreciation for the power of the private sector, just having spent four and a half years as a senior technologist in a big bank. There's some incredible capabilities, incredible technologists, but there's pieces that they're seeing that can help enrich what we see in the government and vice versa. And so the difference between partnership in my mind is, you know, partnership is you bring people in every week, maybe every month, maybe every quarter, and you sit down and you have a meeting, you drink coffee, you have some donuts there, you talk about what you want to accomplish. Operational collaboration is on a very regular basis, you know, day to day, you are operating in the same space, sharing information in near real time with the sense of urgency mandated by the threat that we face in cyber. And that's what we are building with the JCDC. And we another thing that's hugely important about this, it's early days, right? We, we are in the midst of building it, but, but I constantly hear and probably said when I was in the private sector, we send stuff to the government and we see nothing back. Mm -hmm. 
And so we want to change that as well, right? I mean, we want to give feedback. Yeah, we're not seeing anything with it or yeah, we are. And that can happen in the type of channels that we are developing to achieve exactly what uh, ranking member Kako said, which is, you know, the most important word, whether it's a business relationship or a marriage, and that's trust, you know, incredibly hard to build, incredibly easy to lose. And so every day we're working to build that trust. And that kind of goes to the last point. I agree, you know, regulation in some cases is useful. As a bank, we were incredibly regulated, as you imagine, but CISA doesn't want to be a regulator. Right. Our, our, the magic of CISA is that we are a trusted partner, the people you mm -hmm. call when you need help, when you need assistance, when you need cost free services. Uh, and we're the ones who share the information in an anonymized way that protects the privacy of victim to prevent other people from getting hacked and having us as a regulator, I think, would um, really impact our ability to establish those trusted partnerships. I'll just reiterate that because it's one of the things that comes up repeatedly in interviews is that when you ask companies what agency they want to talk to, uh, CISA is always at the top of the list. So um, let's talk a little bit though about uh, reporting and awareness and they're linked. So there's efforts yet again to get people to report cyber incidents. Um, what do you think we're going to see come out of that effort? And that's really a question for both of you. Um, well, Jen, I, you go first this time. I went first last time. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we we strongly support this, and we strongly support it because it goes back to my my theory of the case, which is everything's connected, everything's interdependent, everything mm -hmm. is vulnerable. We all ride on very similar technology backbones, and so if you are seeing an attack, an incident, you know that can be traced back to other places in our critical infrastructure. It can have a real impact on the nation. And so very important for us to get information to allow us to share that in an anonymized, useful, relevant, timely, actionable way to enable other network defenders to protect themselves from that threat. As I've said many times, we are not here to name, to shame, to blame, to stab the wounded. We are here to help. We are here to share that information to prevent others from being hacked. And so we think it's incredibly important legislation. We think we need the information as timely as possible. Uh, but also, you know, I know when you're, when you're managing an event in the private sector and you're under duress, you know, it takes a while to figure out, is there really something there there? Some, you know, right away, this is a bad day. Some, you're really not sure. So what I wanna make sure is we are not overburdening the private sector with having to send us information that's erroneous, nor do we want to you know, receive erroneous information. This is all about signal, not noise. And so we gotta get that right. And that's why we're a fan of the you know, rulemaking period where we can consult with industry to ensure this is not burdening them or burdening us, but actually raising the baseline of the entire cyber ecosystem. This is really good for everybody. Um, and I wish people would not think about it as like a regulatory reporting thing. This is really about providing the information that you need that will help keep the entire ecosystem safe. Yeah, one of the last things Jen just said is, is really what I, what I think. It's, um, it's setting up the foundation upon which the, the flow of information can, can, can happen. And um, uh, it, I don't see it as regulatory. I see it as, as a, a nudging collaboration because uh, if you have incident reporting, but uh, CISA doesn't get better at uh, uh, operationalizing that, that incident reporting and, and coming back with directives and assistance to the private sector, then it's not gonna work. So this is a beginning, like I said uh, before, but my view of legislation is uh, you take these incremental steps and you build upon them as you, as you go. And instead of having these big massive bills that are gonna, are they, are they, everything's gonna solve the world's problems and they often don't. You take these incremental steps and okay, look, got to share this information, okay? But we understand it can't be a burden. We understand that it can't be an undue burden. We understand that it can't uh, cripple your ability to respond to an incident. At the same time, you have to meet these reporting requirements. But at the other hand, CISA gets maybe about one percent, if that, of of the uh, 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 of the attacks that are out there in the world. And the more information they have in those attacks, the better they can send out directors to help everybody. It's a force multiplier. So 
it, it really is, to me, I view it as the foundation upon which the collaboration is going to happen. And again, I keep sorry, I keep going back to task forces, but we, but that's what works. When we have people come into the task force, we have memorandums of understanding. And memorandums of understanding, one of the key components is information sharing. And it was we mandated if you're going to be part of our team, you know, you want to work with us, you're going to have to exchange information. Everybody liked that except the FBI, but <laughs> we got past that. Um, but you know, all the agencies on federal, state, and local, after a while, it just became muscle memory that the exchange of information happened. And we haven't had that cataclysmic event since 9-11 because of it. So um, that's how I view it in, in, this, in the same manner. So we got an easy one that I'm going to throw in because I want to come back to reporting and awareness. The easy one is, where did you get the shark? <laughs> <laughs> it was a birthday present from my husband many, many years ago. Because my first duty assignment in the Army was 25th Infantry Division in Schofield Barracks. I lived up on the North Shore, up on Pipeline Beach. Big uh, scuba diver, terrible surfer, but love the water. So shark comes with me everywhere. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, we've tried this uh, reporting before and it hasn't worked. One of the reasons it hasn't worked is because we got the threshold wrong. You might remember that there's a material incident threshold that exists now. And it turns out that there's never been a cyber incident that crossed the material threshold incident uh, level set by the SEC. So you've touched on a lot of it, uh, but it's going to be post facto. That's a question. Um, how do you build the trust to, to get over the people's reluctance to uh, share? And what are the assurances you might, I think you're working on them. So let's, let's recognize that. What are the assurances we need to get people to trust to share information uh, in real time and not like uh, two weeks later? Go ahead, Jim. You go first. Yeah, I mean, we are, what I'd say is, you know, we recognize all of those issues, Jim, they've been around for a long time. It's one of the reasons that they set up the legislation in 2015 to provide liability protection for sharing information. And so we are in the midst of building something which I think is a paradigm shift. We bring people together, the right people to share information. It's already happening. I think the Congressman mentioned Black Matter, the triple seal thing that we work with NSA and FBI about a type of ransomware. You know, that was enriched by our partners from Broadcom and from Codeware. So we're already seeing value from sharing things with the private sector, having that enrich it with what they see. Now, you know, that's the that's the products that we're working on now to provide to the to the wider ecosystem on the incident response. Like, don't get me wrong. We, we get reporting. Um, we certainly have a lot of work going on in the field. But as the congressman said, I think it's you know probably a very small percentage of what's out there. And we are going to have to work our way through this. It's why that rulemaking period, that consultative rulemaking period, because I think you said the exact right thing. What's the threshold so that we're not overburdened with noise and a company is not overburdened with er or providing us erroneous information? And so like everything else I've said over the past year, we're at a moment, we are at an inflection point. We have the right leadership in Congress. We have the right leadership across the federal government. We have a sense of urgency. We've got uh, people who are making this a priority across the country. And so, you know, we got to get after it. We got to take advantage of it and bad on me if I screwed up. Yeah, I mean, I don't, there's not much to add to that. I, she, she, she's exactly right. And um, it, it is trust and it is, um, um, uh, threading the needle between getting them to report the, the things and making sure they're not going to have liability for it, but at the same time, uh, making sure that it makes it worth a while to do so. And, and, she, and what she articulated is exactly what we need to do. So we have a lot of questions. I'm going to pick one topic and then give you each time for a final remark. The topic I'm going to pick is the imposition of consequences on actors who are doing things uh, that are inappropriate in cyberspace. If they're a criminal, we know what to do if we can get our hands on them. But if they're a state, we've been kind of stymied. And I've been in talks with <clears throat> a number of NATO countries on this. What's your thinking on consequences? Where do, where do you wanna go with this? And what we hear a lot is, of course, is if we do something that will make the Russians mad. Uh, that's actually a powerful argument in some circles. I, I don't really care, but maybe you do. Tell me what you wanna do on consequences. Well, I, I, I think the consequences for me, and uh, you know, quite frankly, Jen and I have had discussions even this week about it. And um, I think that we need to do more than we're doing at a minimum. 
Uh, we, we can't have China acting with impunity, uh, attacking our systems and malign actors within Russia acting, on, acting under the imprimatur of uh, Putin to be uh, um, uh, go away unchecked. And they largely have. And I think that um, we need to not do something that's gonna start World War III, but we do need something that's gonna make them feel the pain. And I think sanctions are a big thing. Uh, I think they're a huge thing. Personally, and I'm not articulating uh, what Jen would think, but you look at someone like China, they've been involved in a number of major attacks on our, our, our homeland. Um, I don't see a lot of response to it yet. Um, and I certainly don't see sanctions that have, that have really come out that have really been meaty. And then you, you, you roll that into the fact that China not only is doing that, but they're, you know, they're involved in genocide of their own people. And yet we're gonna trot into China in six months and, and uh, allow them to look like a world leader at the Olympics and like everything's okay. Well, that, that's, that shouldn't be, we should rethink those types of things. But I do think that we need to find a balance and, and, and respond with strength and without, uh, without going overboard, but definitely coming back with a firm hand. And I, when I, in my time as a prosecutor, bad guys only understand strength. They understand nothing else. They are not intimidated by words. They're, they are only intimidated by actions. When I brought someone in, if they, a really bad guy, if they sense for a second that we didn't have a strong case or that we didn't have him dead, dead to rights, um, the, he would get everybody and including himself to go to trial and blah, blah, blah. But if I, if he knew he was toast and he knew his options were mandatory life or if he cooperates, he might get 20 years, uh, chances are if I had my, did my job, that guy's cooperating with me and we're making, we're going after many more criminals. Um, so the, you've got to under, they, we've got to project more strength than we're doing now. It's one of, one of the five pillars that I, of my whole cyber plan. And um, I, I, Jen is far more of an expert in this area than I am. And she's definitely enlightened me. At first I'm like, oh, let's just fry everything in our country. Well, you got to think about that now. And do we want to ratchet it up? But we, there is ways we can do it. And I think sanctions are a very, very effective way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're over time, but I, I would just say, you know, we all know we have the glassy house issue. Um, uh -huh. uh, but I think of it in terms of, you know, you go back to Joe Nye's piece, uh, deterrence and dissuasion in cyberspace, and you think about deterrence by punishment. And I think there is, um, there are options. I think, you know, deterrence by norms, entanglement, and then we are squarely in the deterrence by denial uh, uh, phase of this or, or capability of this. But I agree with you, it has to be all instruments of national power and we have to be able to uh, stand behind uh, when we say we're gonna impose costs, when we say we're gonna hold actors accountable, we have to be able to have tools uh, that can effectively do that. So my world is all about deterrence by denial, but this has to be a whole of uh, instruments of national power uh, effort. Yeah, I just want to add one thing, quick thing to that. And that is, um, uh, that's why I think Chris Inglis's position is so important because we, you know, we have the quarterback at CISA, kind of like the head coach. He's got to see everything and be able to advise a president. That's one of the reasons I, I was such a strong supporter of having a national cyber director. I think it's, part of that should be his role. And uh, working, of course, with, uh, with uh, all the other sectors of government. But we need that person to look at the, the playing field and say, OK, how bad was this? And what is a good response? What is a proportional response? What is, a, what is a, an effective response? And I think he should have a very strong say, and not just people at State Department, or not just people in the military. I think it should be uh, English should have that authority, and he should have that stature. And he's a great teammate. So yes, he is. Terrific to work with. One of the strengths we have now, and I say this in a bipartisan way, is we really do have a strong team, the strongest mm -hmm. team we've ever had in cybersecurity. Um, I apologize to all the people whose questions we did not have time to get to. I will do one for both of our speakers. Someone asked, North Korea charged that the US was the biggest hacking empire in the world. Is that true? No. Okay, so with that, we can move on. Uh, if either of you have any final remarks, uh, now would be a good time. Any final conclusions? Go ahead, Jen. Oh, I just wanted to say thanks so much. It, you know, I always say cyber is a team sport. And I have been incredibly encouraged by what I've seen across the federal government with our private sector partners. And then uh, on the Hill with the incredible leadership and partnership of ranking member Katko. So uh, thanks very much for the opportunity and great to spend time with both of you. Uh, yeah, I, I, do, I echo your sentiments and I will know to show that I am bipartisan. 
<laughs> and uh, that's not a, something that's very common nowadays in Washington. I have a lot of disagreements with this president, but I firmly applaud him for the appointments he's made in the cyber realm with Jen and with Easterly and Newberger. I mean, with English and Newberger. I think we've got a we've got a core of seriously good talent, and it's re being reflected. And uh, uh, I think we in Homeland Security are feeding off of that. And so I think I agree with you. We we have a very very good team, and our job is to make sure that they have everything they need. And that's that's I want to make sure I can do that going forward. And I couldn't give a damn if they're Republicans or Democrats. I just want to get the job done. And let's not forget Matt Olson uh, in the National Security Division. Mm -hmm. okay. So great team, uh, great event. You guys were incredibly articulate, which was a relief because I didn't have to do very much. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you for doing this and have a good weekend. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.